My name is Manaya Kese, I work with Peace FM. You have promised abolition bed tax, e-levy, flat, import duty, one-time tax amnesty, among others. If you really believe that that is what Ghana needs, why should we wait till you become the president and not implement it now? Good evening, Your Excellency. So, my, my question is coming from a group of students on scholarship abroad. They are concerned that the scholarship secretary is not doing what it has to do for them. At page 27 of your manifesto, you speak about harmonizing public uh, scholarships. And there's a purpose for it. You say the purpose is to give full visibility. Beyond the visibility, what will you do about this now and not later? They, they are some of them for 20 months they have not received their stipends. In a number of universities in the UK, in Warwick, Coventry, Nottingham, they are under threat of losing their studentship. In Birmingham, 11 of them have already been withdrawn, particularly knowing about the fourth estate's investigations that scholarship bonanza about what appears to be a racketeering in that place. And will you forbid and prohibit politically exposed persons worthy enough, known in society, think, from accessing these scholarships? Thank, thank you. I think the question is very well. After that, you go to um, the regions without playing in Accra. Western North. Please, in the microphone to the Western North guy. Would that Eastern to do Western North to do the other regions as well? Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Esposito Inokedusei. I work with the Beat FM. Somewhere in last year, the former president, Mahama, on his campaign tour in Western North region claimed Coco bodies on the verge of collapse. Do you believe Coco Board has collapsed? And what is your plans for Coco Board? I don't want to go deep. Thank you. Thank you. Sabi, you are here. Well, sir, good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Sami Yafi. I work with CTFM in Channel 1 TV. Um, so a few meters away from us is the site for the construction of the National Cathedral. We know a huge sums of money have been signed into the project. What would you do about it if or when you become president of this country? Thank you very much. Excellency, please take these questions again. 14 key promises in your manifesto, but none of them were apostate timelines on it. So, how can you hold you accountable if not? Because it seems to become mere political rhetorics. Thank you. All that we're seeing is 15 Ghana cities. About 15 Ghana cities. Okay, over 15 Ghana cities. Thank you. How do I explain this to my mother, a cocoa seller, that in 2014, the fundamentals were weak. In 2024, where a dollar is now 15 cities, the fundamentals are not weak. But the prices of goods and services are high today. Thank you. Okay. No, no. no. Yes, let her black come and then you come. I want to hear more of the ladies. Are. Sure, your family have not been quiet. I'm in here, you are doing TV, and you are doing my film. 
na masabisa yes babu kaka bika gigi kai me ba traversi e she dr baumia ne she she for fraude e de kon etia galamsi eh aya dia so ma no kon ache e no achi so afron plains 2016 mpp she for football e se bo ku de bridge e beto afron so so e pese de ku na ho she she e ku ko ko sports stadium so e pese de ku no be bia ti bia no e wo asat na the facts on on the on the issue um, if that is the case, I uh, will try to expedite their payment. Um, so I will, I will, I will, I will, when I leave here, I'm going to raise that issue. Um, there is also the issue of six new stadia that uh, and only one of the existing five is being maintained. I think that that is a very good question. Um, one of the problems we have um, is the lack of maintenance of our pitches. I met with the Black Stars in Kumasi before their last day there. And when we met, um, the coach and the players were very clear um, that what they really needed, and this is why I've put it in our manifesto, um, was an international standard pitch. You know, that the, the pitches that we have uh, difficult to, to play on, and we needed international standard pitches. So, in fact, in the manifesto, we need to do it. And I believe that we need professional management in terms of the maintenance of these pitches. And we need to train people um, and also bring in the people with the knowledge. Um, and so, we are going to, to do that because we, we just build the pitches, and there is very little main maintenance uh, of the pitches and, and the management of the pitches. So I think this is going to be one of the things that we are, we are going to do. The building of the uh, five other stadia, as I said, you know, we made that commitment um, actually as far back as uh, 2019, uh, that with all these new regions that are coming on board, we will have to build stadia for them to to encourage sports, and I believe that um, we've done uh, quite a few already in terms of the multi-paper sports stadia. We are doing 10, we've completed six, four are almost done, and we're going to do another five. So, I mean, the record is there that we've done 10. I think that we can do another five uh, uh, without much of a problem. Um, then the question came, on the flat rate and whether second-hand clothing and spare parts will be paying the same rate. Oh, I think that the categories will be different. And the flat rate, what we want to do um, is to uh, bring a lot more predictability in import duty payment. At the moment, there isn't predictability and there's a lot of discretion that seems to come in uh, from time to time. And so what we are saying is that we're going to bring in a flat rate in cities. So if you're bringing in spare parts and there's a 40-foot container of spare parts, you will know exactly what the duty is, is for the spare parts, say 20,000 cities or 15,000 cities or 30,000 cities. It's a flat rate. So when the 40-foot container arrives of the spare parts, then you know you'll pay 40,000. If you are bringing in second-hand clothing, um, and that is attracting 20,000 series duty. You will know before that it will come. It's not that it will arrive and then the price will change because they will say the exchange rate has changed, so you pay more. But it will be a flat rate. So you are, there is no, there's not going to be any confusion. Chicken will attract a different rate from, you know, uh, spare parts will attract a different rate from rice attract a different rate from, from second-hand clothing. But you will know beforehand, before the goods actually, before you import the goods, they will all be published. Um, and so that we get away from, uh, you know, these under invoicing and misclassification issues. Uh, these are really hampering revenue collection. Many, many importers invest time in misclassifying your bringing Chicken and they say it is uh, fish or something, but then it's classification and so on.
we, we will have to deal with that. Then the issue about um, cars for teachers and what we want to do for journalists and all of that. I, I really believe that one of the uh, major problems, and we address this in the manifesto, that hampers workers and livelihoods in our country is, because, is the fact that we operate a cash-based system. Unlike in the advanced world where they operate a credit-based system. So in an initial, life is much harder if you are a teacher in Ghana versus if you are a teacher in the US or the UK. Even if you are paid the same amount every month, the teacher in the UK will consume probably five to six times more than you, goods than you in Ghana. Why? Because they are able to obtain credit and pay over time. And so by you, we in Ghana here, we have to accumulate cash for whatever we want to buy. If you want to buy a car and the car is costing 100,000 or 150,000, you have to look for 150,000 to pay for the car. But if you were in the UK, you would probably be paying a thousand every month to pay to pay for the car or much less. But so your salary goes a long, a much longer way. So one of the things that we are bringing in, as far as uh, our manifesto is concerned, is to move Ghana from a cash-based system to a credit-based system. It's very, very important because the reason why a credit-based system works in the advanced countries because they are able to compute credit scores for everybody. You know, a credit scoring is key to a credit-based system because it then assesses the risk of any borrower in terms of borrowing uh, you know, money for a fridge or a car or a TV or whatever. So the credit scoring becomes very key. 14 years ago, I wrote a book uh, on um, monetary policy and financial sector reform in Africa. This was in 2010. And in this book, I was making the case for why Ghana and Africa generally, we needed to move towards the credit-based systems. And the reason why uh, is to really bring down the stress on living uh, in our system. The reason why they are able to do what the, the credit system in the advanced countries is because the data basis exists for the computation of the credit scores. So the unique, what, the, what we need, a unique identity that exists, address, it exists. Financial inclusion, a bank account where you can, it exists. So when we came into office, I was very clear in my mind where we wanted Ghana to go. We needed to put in place the digital address system, the Ghana card, which we have done. We needed to put in place the digital the address system. When we looked at the address system, um, I realized that it was going to be very difficult um, to go with what we had before, street addresses and so on. So we, I propose that we go with digital address systems. I mean, at the time, only one country in the world, Mongolia, had a digital address, a wholesale digital address system. Only one country in the world. But I said, look, Ghana should move in that direction because we can leverage on GPS technology and have a digital address system. Now, we have been able to get a digital address system, and we are the second country in the whole world to have uh, a wholesale digital address system. Every part of Ghana, we can, we can have a digital address. Now, then we, the third leg of this to, to allow us to get to credit scoring was to make sure most Ghanaians will have a bank account so that your trans financial transactions uh, can be scored and monitored and so on. But when we came in, I 
realized that, of course, very small percentage of people had bank accounts, but a lot of people had mobile money accounts. You know, and so I made the point that the key to get everybody financially included was to have that interoperability between the mobile money account and the bank account. And so we were able to do this uh, mobile money interoperability. And so today, Ghana now um, has all the elements. All the elements are now in place for Ghana to move to a credit-based system. All the elements are now in place. And so we expect credit score. I mean, in fact, interestingly, when I made the point that individual credit scoring doesn't yet exist in Ghana, people were uh, actually arguing, uh, saying that that wasn't true. But that is absolutely true. Uh, so we are, we, we are going to begin in a proper wholesale individual credit scoring, which would then provide us the basis so that, you know, people can buy their cars. And uh, I mean, someone was talking about the local um, producers and all of that. Once they know that we can offer this to teachers and they can pay over time, or to journalists, and they can pay over time, and they don't have to bring all the cash at once, then life will be much more better to all of us. So my expectation is that the credit scoring system, I, I think it's are, move, are moving much faster than I expected. Um, it's now manifest, we're moving to it, but I think that it's likely to be, begin before the end of this year, because of where we are, uh, I expect to, to launch it uh, reasonably soon, because of where where we are now. We've got everything in place, and but that will fundamentally change everything for Ghana. Currently in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's only one country that has a credit scoring system and a credit, that is South Africa. Ghana will be, before the end of this year, the second country in Sub-Saharan Africa with a credit based system. But it will bring down the pressure on all of our workers um, once you enter into into that. Um, then um, the, there was a question that went on the lack of timelines for the manifesto uh, in, in terms of promises and so on. Um, I think that when you are going for an election, <laughs> you, you are going to go for an election for a four-year term initially, isn't it? Yeah, so your promises have to be in line with that type of office, right? That this is what I'm, I want you to elect me to do these things, right? Um, but I think that we have a pretty good record uh, in terms of honoring our promises. We've done some work to look at our 2016 manifesto, what proportion of those promises we've honored, and it has been 83% of the 2016 manifesto has been honored, 83%. Then when you look at the 2020 manifesto, 2020, even in the midst of all this crisis, we are fulfilling or we fulfill 80% of our 2020 manifesto. My opponent in his 2012 manifesto, when he became president, he's only, he only fulfilled 28%. We've done the numbers. 28% of his 2012 manifesto. 280 promises. He didn't fulfill 203 of the 280 promises. He only fulfilled 28% of his promises. So I think that we have a better record as far as fulfilling promises. And when I put something down, I usually usually have a good idea what I how I'm going to get it done. Uh, and so that is that is I think um, something that we are going to. To look at. I think that the issue has come about suffering. Uh, and I remember very well, you know, my uh, statements uh, teachers are suffering, and doctors are suffering, and journalists are suffering. <laughs> and everybody is suffering in, in, 
in, in uh, 2016, which was the key section um, in that in that regard. But I think that we've we've moved on significantly since 2016, and we can point to a few things that we have because at the end of the day, you re you you reduce suffering broadly by creating jobs so that you give people something to do or you bring in some social interventions to ameliorate uh, the problems, the hardships that are there. So you need to look at what we have done. We've created at least 2.1 million jobs, um, per capita income um, in, in, in CD terms has gone up uh, almost uh, more than more, threefold. Um, uh, in dollar terms, per capita income from 2016 has gone up from 1,978 to 2,436. So GDP, GDP has gone up, per capita income has also gone up. As I said, you know, we, we've kept all public sector workers employed. We didn't lay off anyone during the, the, the COVID and, and, and we have and done that and we kept the lights on. We suffered so much from doing so. Everybody was suffering from doing so. But we have kept the lights on for eight years. Teacher trainees were suffering. We restored their teacher trainee allowances. Nursing trainees were suffering. We restored their allowances. Uh, people who were using the NHIS had major issues. The people who had sickle cell um, we're suffering because the hydroxyurea, which was really needed, and uh, wasn't covered by the NHIS. Uh, today it is uh, covered by the NHIS. Today kidney dialysis is covered, as well as childhood cancer uh, was also covered. Um, you also see that for the for people, the issue of rent advance, the National Rental Assistance Scheme has come in to really help uh, in that. During COVID, we gave free water for a year, free electricity. Uh, for people in the rural areas and remote areas, we brought in medical drones to deliver um, medicines, vaccines, blood, across 2,694 health facilities. And even recently, when there was flooding, uh, because of rain in the front plains, we had to um, get the drones to take examination papers uh, over there, which were not initial. Parents um, have now had the benefit of free SHS for eight years, have had the benefit of free TV, and therefore the suffering of a lot of parents in paying fees has also reduced. Um, school fee, when we were in uh, coming in in 2016, only 1.6 million children benefited from school feeding. Today, 4 million children are benefiting from school feeding. More than that, we have also absorbed the examination fees for all students for BEC and WACSI examinations. And then, um, as I said before, we doubled the number of student loan recipients from 30 to 58,000. We've introduced the no guarantor student loans. A lot of students who are suffering, looking for guarantors, now just need their Ghana card and they will they will get it. You know, so we we so we, we have do, we've done quite a bit in, in uh, we brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we procured the ambulances uh, for many of our uh, constituencies or many of our districts. And also, if you look at um, the small and medium enterprises who had major, major problems in accessing um, funding, uh, we provided funding over the last eight years to 444,000 SMEs, um, 1.4 billion pounds, uh, which has been quite significant by any account and very historic in that, in, that, in that regard. So I think that 
yes, the, the, the suffering is there, uh, but we've done a lot of social intervention um, to, to ameliorate that suffering. It's not gone, but at least we can point to things that have, that have gone in to reduce the suffering of our people. I mean, even renewing national health insurance card was a problem. Just to renew it, many people had to go and sleep. I know in, in, in my constituency, people had to go to the NHI office and sometimes sleep for three days before they could renew national health insurance uh, membership. But today, you just sit in your home and renew. Today, you sit in your home and buy electricity credit. You don't need to take trotter or taxi and go somewhere else to do it. So we're, we're, we've done quite a bit to to reduce the suffering of people, um, even though, of course, it is not uh, complete. We still have more, more to do and we'll continue. So the other question, which is a, a nice one, Vanessa was asking, if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rate will expose you. It is a, a truism. It was true, true then, and it's still true today. It's an economic truism that the, the, once the fundamentals weaken, you will see the impact on the exchange rate um, fundamentally. And what we talk about, um, many of these fundamentals, we're talking about the GDP growth rate, we're talking about the fiscal balance, we're talking about the exchange, uh, the reserves, level of the reserves that you have, inflation, and so on. When we came into office, um, during the first term before we hit COVID, between 2017 and 2019, you saw the fundamentals pretty much strengthening by all accounts. And the exchange rate depreciated in those three years by less than 5%. That was the lowest depreciation in the currency for 28 years. 28 years, that was the lowest depreciation of the currency. Um, I think we went up, uh, if, I mean, even after COVID, we, we didn't get that high a depreciation. But the biggest shock for the economy came in 2022. I mean, this was, I mean, all hell was breaking loose in 2022. Inflation, 54% as of November 2022, uh, exchange rate had depreciated at 54%. I mean, and of course, you could look at the fundamentals were in trouble at that time. You saw fiscal deficit going up, you saw inflation going up, growth uh, declining. And so for me, it wasn't uh, surprising, even though it was shocking, the extent to which the exchange rate went. So uh, 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 the point that, that we are making is that once the fundamentals weak, you will get it shown in the exchange rate. Uh, and this is why we've seen that recently, uh, even though we are depreciating in November at 54%, this year, the depreciation has been 18.6% so far, right? We are, we are, we are looking at 18.6%. Um, so you are looking at a, a situation this year. Why, why is the depreciation lower? Because the fundamentals have strengthened. The fiscal deficit is under 5%. We are running a primary surplus uh, growth. It has gone up first quarter to 4.7% higher than projected, the reserves are increasing, uh, and the goal for oil program is helping. So as the fundamentals and inflation today is around 20%, um, so there has been a strengthening of the fundamentals, and you've also seen more relative exchange rate stability. I, for, I mean, in all of this, I want you to, to, to take this away. When I look at um, what was happening in 2022, I mean, the 
uh, depreciation of the city. Um, it was very scary. In fact, in 2022, this, this economy was on the verge of, of collapse because you saw our reserves decline very steeply. The exchange rate was blowing up, inflation was up, and my worry at that time, frankly, was that I could see this country moving towards Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was what was clearly in my mind at that time, because you saw protests in Sri Lanka. They had no fuel. Room saw was there, and when you saw the way our reserves were moving in 2022, we were heading right in that direction, that we were going to get queues on the street, we, really, we couldn't buy fuel, we couldn't pay for so many things. And it was in that context that I came up with two policies. One was the gold for oil policy and the gold purchase program of the Bank of Canada. Because, because when I looked at it, you know, sometimes when uh, they say necessity is the mother of invention, uh, because once, I, when I looked at it, we were headed for disaster, you know, but I, uh, I made the case, I looked at numbers, and I said, well, how are we going to get foreign exchange to buy fuel in this declining reserves? And then I looked at gold. I said, let's take a look at gold. I looked at the reserves of gold that we have, and it was 8.7 tons, 8.7. That is from independence to 2022. Our gold reserves were 8.7 tons, 8.7. I mean, when you look at the US, they are 8,000 tons. In the, in, in, in the in gold reserves, the UK, Germany, France, you know, all above 2,000, 3,000 tons. And Ghana, the largest gold producer in Africa, had 8.7 tons. So I said this is uh, uh, something that we need to change. And so Ghana needs to start, because the, the thing about gold for us is that we don't have to export anything to get gold. If we have cities, we'll buy gold right here locally. So we can use our cities to buy gold without needing to export cocoa or oil or diamonds or timber. We just buy the gold locally. That is what we have that many countries don't have. It's just something that many, many countries don't have that uh, opportunity to do so. So. I then came up with the, the idea that let's do, instead of, since we don't have forex and a bank uh, to pay for um, oil, let's use gold. And therefore, we went into this gold for oil and gold purchase program for reserves. And what is very, very interesting, frankly, without this gold for oil, the gold purchase program, this economy would have collapsed. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in that. Why do I say so? In the last couple of years, Bank of Ghana under the Gold Purchase Program has been able to buy five billion dollars of gold. Five billion dollars of gold. Think about it. We've gone to the IMF to look for three billion dollars, which is going to be paid over three years. This is what, why we are going through. But locally, we've been able to buy five billion. And this is why there are no queues for petrol. This is why so has not happened in Ghana. Because we, otherwise, where would you have gotten five billion dollars? Where would you have gotten five billion dollars from your reserves to keep up all the payments you need? to me. So um, that has been for us the game changer. And so the pilot, the pilot that we are seeing with the gold purchase program and the gold for oil program, I want to institutionalize it going forward. And this is why 
by the grace of God, when I am president next year, we are going to, to institutionalize this. Someone asked me, oh, why is it that the French West African countries have not seen depreciations in their currencies, Côte d'Ivoire, um, Senegal, and all of these? I said, well, they are anchored. They are, the currency is anchored to the euro through the French franc. So they are anchored. Unfortunately for Ghana, we don't have an anchor. There is no anchor for the city. So what I am going to introduce, what I want to institutionalize, is something that we have learned from this Christ. Um, you will not find it in any textbook. Maybe they will, some people will now write it in a textbook. They are now, you won't find it in a textbook. It's not, it, it's not in a textbook. Because what, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is fairly simple, as I said, but we have had to learn about it. Because what we are going to do is to say that if you want foreign exchange, and we, we've tried it already, the pilot, with some of the big companies. One big company had 3.1 billion Ghana seeds. They wanted to externalize 3.1 billion Ghana seeds. And they were looking for foreign exchange. Can you imagine the impact on our market? If someone comes out with 3.1 billion cities looking for dollars. So they, are, they, they, they were trying to talk to the Bank of Ghana and all of that. So their chairman flew into the country and came to see me and said, we are having these problems and we have to ex, you know, externalize our dividends and all of that, we have 3.1 billion, and we are looking for dollars. We're looking for dollars from all the banks and all of that. So I listened to them, and then I asked, will you take gold? They said, oh sure, gold is for it. That is not a problem. So I called the governor and said, look, why don't we put three, this 3.1 billion through the gold purchase program. And guess what? It was done virtually over. And their money was given to them. So essentially, what we are, we are saying is that demand for the dollars, you bring your cities. We have the gold. There's no doubt. I mean, the gold is there. I mean, we have 5 billion ounces even not yet explored as the Geological Survey Authority has told us. That's ten trillion dollars. Right? So bring your cities, we buy the gold, give you your forex. It's that simple. So your demand for the forex will be met by an equal supply of gold, and Ghana will see stability of the currency long term. So we're looking for a simple solution to a long term stability for the city. And that is what we are bringing in, and that is what um, is happening. What I'll tell you, and I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, is that other countries have started coming to Ghana to learn about our gold purchase program. The other countries have started coming. Uh, the Bank of Ghana is inundated with requests for people to come and learn. As I said, this is not in textbooks, uh, and that this is what we, we are doing. So I, I, I think that fundamentals ultimately has an impact on the exchange rate and the, but the crisis that we have gone through has now made us to think a bit outside the box and, and, and bring in this new solution. Now, I, I, I was asking about Dalan Sey and what we are doing about it. And I, 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 so you. <laughs> Any of my main critique. Um, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, 
Sanchez, you be here, the easy, Mirpam, Ubia, Oya, and I'm saying, Ubina, mining license, I will be the age man. So, you be some random district committees, traditional leaders, through the Millions Commission, Ubina license, so we will register the Obergana card. Then, you be here, community mining schemes. Your logical survey authority. Where should share? Omo survey no. No omo who say a hana gold no wo a hana gold no. And then say omo two gold no. And a trial and error. But what could two ha? When you know what could ha? When you know what? Now we say assassin. But yet the data. Bah, now you can't trust me. Now I'm saying for or small scale miners. A hana gold no wo. Into a chisha community mining scheme or a man, Monko Ho, Untutu, Omo Ya, Naya, Omo Gold, no, Adia, Co, Bank of Ghana. In C, San Chisheno, the Yediba, Ibe Chisha, Minerals Development Bank, a man, a mining, small scale mining sector also. Say the Agri Development Bank, Yeshisha, and for if you are for. She's a new minerals development bank, and not small scale miners, not a poor woman, no money equipment. The um, common use, are there different common user facilities? If you get here, you two gold now, now you could show one a high percentage of gold amount. And I get it back to home. I'm a OBR in the community mining schemes, so they are promoting more gold uh, from their activities. And he, um, San Yeshi, San Jay Basua, immediately said, and I'm saying, we make trust, we and CZ, we be a excavator, now Yashin or that, or whatever, San Yano, a bit trust, so, maybe a call. Um, I have about a front place and then Coco, I don't know, I, 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 I'm missing the. A front place question. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and the bridge. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And I got post posted your 2020 book as we see who she made us. Yes. So the a front place bridge, I think, is uh, one of the bridges that is we are working under with the Korean facility. It's one of the projects that we've presented to, to be done under the Korean facility. We will say, the Koreans have given us a grant and a, 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 a concessional loan of two billion dollars, and, and we have had to take a number of projects to to them for funding. I think that bridge over there from is is one of them. And then um, then Koko Sports Stadium. I have to follow up with the minister on that one. I can't give you a direct answer on that. Um, <coughs> then the. The uh, question came, the first 100 days, uh, what would you do? Uh, I'm definitely not taking a honeymoon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are going to get straight to work to put things in place. I, I think that for me, um, the, the focus is on jobs. And so you have to put in um, the budget as quickly as possible so that you can uh, make sure that you know the tax amnesty regime comes into place the flat tax regime comes into place um, so that by the time your of your first budget in march um, these things the ghana first by ghana first policy uh, that we put it in uh, and pass the law so that we can get the, the Ghana Affairs policy, the E levy will go uh, uh, because we have to uh, focus on digitalization of, of, of uh, the economy, and, and so we need to to, to take out uh, the, the E levy as well. You know, so these are some of the things that I, I believe that we can we can do uh, very 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 quickly uh, as we come in. Um, you know, to be within the first 100 days. But I think that uh, we're going to be very, very hard at work uh, to, to, to look at things that the business 
moving, the tariff structure for, for the uh, businesses, commercial businesses, residential, we, we have to look at it. The flat rate regime has to come in immediately. Those things that will get business moving very quickly to create the jobs um, are the things that we are going to do immediately so that we are serious about business and serious about job creation. Thank you very much.